to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation whose stolen land we're currently on. And I want to pay my respects to the first scientists and all elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, you know, on the stolen land, there's been more than 60,000 years of knowledge from the first scientists. Most of us joining today are scientists and academics, and I hope that you are aware of Indigenous science and centering that knowledge in the work that you do. If you want to support the new generation of First Nation scientists, I'd recommend having a look at Deadly Science and donating to them. And welcome to Sydney Ideas. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> This is the University of Sydney's flagship public talks program. I'm Dr. Naomi Kobelik. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm your host for tonight. And welcome to Greening Healthcare. And this is presented with the Sydney Environment Institute as well. You know, last month, July, that was the hottest month ever to be recorded. We are seeing the undeniable impacts of climate change around us. We know that climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health. However, the health risks from climate change have been largely ignored by our federal government, despite becoming increasingly urgent. Between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause around a quarter of a million additional deaths per year. So we know that healthcare is significantly affected by climate change, but it's also a significant contributor to climate change. The healthcare industry is actually responsible for 4.4% of greenhouse gas emissions. For context, that's more than double the emissions of the aviation industry. So today we're going to discuss what greening healthcare looks like. We're going to hear from researchers measuring the severity of the problem, learn how to empower patients and clinicians to make more environmentally sustainable choices, and consider how to best influence policy change for a resilient and sustainable healthcare system that doesn't compromise on quality or safety. I'll be joined today by these three incredible people. Right here we have Professor David Kalamanja, a cardiologist with the Sydney Local Health District. We have Dr. Amanda Irwin just in the centre here, a sustainability researcher here at the University of Sydney. And right down the end we have Rashmi Venkatraman, a senior global health professional. Now, David, you're on the ground, you're seeing this issue firsthand. Can you kind of describe what you've seen and how patient and practitioner decisions are actually made? Yes, thank you, Naomi. Um, it's very interesting that when you talk to a patient about what their journey is, mm. they really predominantly care about one thing, and that's the clinical outcome. So if I said to someone with treatment A, you'll live five years, and that will cost 12 gigabytes of greenhouse gas emissions, and with treatment B, you'll live two years, and that will cost one gigabyte, there's no question they'll choose treatment A. Mm. But increasingly, in a world where several different treatments can have very similar outcomes, we leave the decision to the patient and their family, and it's time for we, as practitioners and consumers, to start to think about the carbon cost of the decisions we make as one of the metrics in decision making. Mm. So, for example, I work in heart disease, and there are two procedures that we offer commonly. One is a stent and the other is a bypass operation. And in some situations, they have exactly the same outcomes for the person. But there might be vast differences in the footprint that they leave. Mm. So we want to start to gather information about what the environmental footprint of what we do costs and see if we can use that information to inform patients, families, healthcare providers and health systems about how to choose, exactly as you said, not to compromise quality or safety, mm. but to have the best outcomes at the lowest carbon price. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And Amanda, um, you're actually on the ground doing some of this research. Can mm -hmm. you tell us a bit about it? Sure, and I guess the, the first way to think about the research that we're doing is to start to be able to quantify what that impact is. Mm -hmm. So as David talked about there, if there's a choice between two procedures, how do we quantify that different carbon cost, mm. as David talked about it? And most of the carbon quantification that you would have heard about, uh, so you're talking about you know, the size of the aviation industry, mm. what does that look like? Most of that quantification is done on a production-based accounting. That's what the Paris Agreement expects from uh, countries. That's what Australia reports in its nationally determined contribution. 
That's production-based accounting. So that's having a look at the emissions at the point at which they are generated. The other way that we like to look at, the other thing we can do to understand that is to look at the consumption-based accounting. And so that's understanding that there is a connection between production and consumption. So, for example, we know in Australia that electricity generation represents about a third or contributes about a third of those greenhouse gas emissions. But we also know that there aren't power plants over there generating electricity just for fun. They're generating that electricity so that we can go and use it in our homes, we can use it to power our hospitals. And so consumption-based accounting is using that connection between the production of the greenhouse gas emissions and the goods and services that we all consume in our daily lives. And in this research, is having a look at the goods and services that sit behind those procedures. And to do that connection between production and consumption, we're relying on economic information, which at first glance seems a little bit unintuitive because we're talking about money rather than carbon emissions. And that's just a factor of the fact that at the moment in our society, we do a really good job of tracking where our money goes. So as an economy, we report on GDP. We understand how we, at, that healthcare represents about 10% of GDP, a little over 10% of GDP in Australia. You see that on the news when you turn it on. We talk about our economic uh, output. We also, when you actually go into the detail of that economic information, that gives us information on the flow of money across the global economy. And so what our research methodology does, looking at consumption-based accounting, is picking up those carbon emissions that happen at the point of production and effectively piggybacking them on that money as it flows through the economy, um, through the supply chains that are taking the raw materials and turning them into the goods and services that David is using when he's there in the mm -hmm. operating theatre, and picking up all the, uh, the sort of the supply chains, all the energy, all the labour, all the raw materials that are going into bringing those goods and services to that point where we're actually using them. And that methodology is called input-output. Mm -hmm. uh, it's used in a lot of other research spaces, but it's only just starting to be used in the healthcare space because we now can get some granular information on the expenditure that happens. So as long as we know how much money we're spending mm -hmm. to deliver those two procedures, We've got information on how economy flows around, where the money goes, and we've got information on those production-based greenhouse gas accounts. Then we can connect those two things, so the production of the greenhouse gas emissions with the consumption that's happening at the point at which the procedure is happening. Also for us, when we're buying things, when we go out to the shops and buy things, we can also connect that consumption back to those greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, that's wonderful. And what are you starting to see with the data amongst your project, David and Amanda? So in... The first analysis, let me go back one step, and mm. that's to say there are, once you start to think in this way, there are lots of cool questions you can ask. Mm. Everyone assumes that using disposables will be worse than re-sterilising, but re-sterilising equipment means someone has to travel to the hospital and back to do that, and they use a lot of electricity to do it, so you can ask valid questions about that. Um, Amanda mentioned that electricity is a huge source of carbon footprint mm. and we leave a lot of electrical equipment on overnight for example mm. mri scanners are only used seven or eight hours a day but they're still run overnight to keep the magnet cool what if we were to just use the magnet 40 hours continuously and turn it off for five days a week would we save five sevenths of the electricity from that so there are once you start to think in this way you can analyze things from the carbon point of view. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone in the healthcare space is just on the cusp of starting to think that way. But the example I gave you earlier of stenting versus bypass surgery, it turns out whether you use the input-output analysis model that Amanda spoke about or a more granular forensic life cycle analysis mm -hmm. model, the bypass operation generates about four times as much carbon as the stent procedure. And if you annualise that across the world, given how many bypass operations and stent procedures are done, that's an absolutely massive amount mm. of environmental impact. Yeah. Um, I actually would love to hear from you, Rashmi. We've heard from our healthcare professionals and thinking about this within the healthcare system. But when it comes to fitting it into the broader picture, what do you think? Yeah, I think... Um and by the way, it's amazing that we're starting mm. to have this kind of innovative and sustainable thinking around mm. how we deliver healthcare services. It's actually a, 
a perfect step in the right direction. Mm. Um, I think it's interesting trying to explain what, where I fit in within the healthcare system. And a good analogy is kind of how I grew up. So my mum's a doctor. And as kids of medical professionals, we all know that you finish school a little early, you hang out in the reception <laughs> and you get to know everyone and you become very observant. And as a kid, that's what I did. You know, There were these days where it was for vaccinations. I remember very clearly. There'd be lines outside her clinic mm. and people, I, could, I did not know what happened in her clinic. Obviously I wasn't allowed in there, um, but it was stress on all their faces before they made it to her and other professionals and apprehension and relief when they left. And for me, I was obsessed with this notion of how can the health system cater to people once they leave healthcare facilities? Mm. And so for me, I work on the broader ends of what we know as a healthcare system, where it's not within the facilities, but rather in the communities, in the world. What is happening now that influence um, our health? And so since then, I've built my education and career on those questions. I work on the intersect of climate and health um, to make sure health systems are sustainable and mm. can care for people and are people and patient-centric outside of facilities and within. Um, so that, you know, this evening we're talking about emissions in healthcare, you know, mm. reducing emissions benefits healthcare and reduces the burden on health systems. So what, what's happening with healthcare and emissions outside of hospitals and clinics? Um, in the big picture of the healthcare system. Mm. So right now, this is the scenario we're in in Australia. Um, Australia has com um, committed, as Amanda mentioned, to net zero emissions by 2050. To meet this goal, Australia must reduce its emissions by 43% by 2030. Mm. In 2021 to 2022, Australia produced 422 million tonnes of coal, that results in 1.1 billion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions in just one year. The resulting health bill from recent research mm. from coal fire power cost the health system a staggering $2.4 billion. And three new coal mines were just approved. Mm. Um, and an interesting paper and some, <laughs> you know, we love... Uh, metaphors and analogies in this space. We really do. Yeah. One that came out from a paper yesterday was a coal mine. The amount of heat generated from a singular coal mine can be somewhere, uh, you know, that's equivalent to 1.7 million uh, atomic bombs. The heat generated from that is the same. And so just to get a picture of what we're talking about, because when we say it in reports, the number is quite small. The mm. impact sounds tiny, but when you equate it, it's quite big. Um, so I'll make another analogy. <laughs> Keep <laughs> if them healthcare, coming. I love them. <laughs> if healthcare is a ship, yes. let's make sure the ship functions efficiently, effectively, and let's make sure it's strong and sustainable in regards to the emissions it, it emits. Mm. And just like other epic stories about ships, let's not forget to repeat, and let's not repeat the history by developing and sustaining the best ship of all time to forget about that fossil fuel iceberg. Mm. It's big. And if we don't look out for those emissions, mm. and if we don't take, and let's not forget the health impacts from the air pollution, that devastating effect it can have on communities, um, that iceberg will sink the ship and it'll do it good. Yeah. And so I think it's incredibly inspiring that we are building ourselves within the system. But I think we've done this before where we, where we have used the health argument to make sure other systems and other sectors are also behaving so we don't let them burden us even further. An example is the tobacco industry. And that fight, we've done it before. So let's learn from history. And I think my goal really, and so many of us working in the sector, our goal is to ensure that everyone knows that health is a human right. Mm. And it's important that each and every single person knows how to advocate for it inside and outside health facilities. Yeah. yeah. I think that's super valuable. We have to come at it from all different angles. I think if we come back to the ship for a second, because I feel like that's, that's where the two of you are, right? We're trying to make sure the healthcare system is more resilient. 
But David, how do we make it more resilient while being sustainable? We have an excellent and resilient healthcare system. Mm. I mean, let's not forget that healthcare in Australia is is possibly second to none in the world. Mm. And so you made a very good point about not compromising on quality. Yeah. But let me give you one example that plays into what Rashmi was saying about mm. taking a lot of healthcare from hospitals, which are huge carbon factories, mm. into communities. Um, palliative care has had enormous publicity in the last two years because of voluntary assisted dying. Mm. But in fact, I don't think many people realise that over 50% of the health care bill in Australia is generated by people in the last two years of their life. Mm. About 90% of Australians die in hospital, many in an intensive care environment, and many more would prefer to die at home, mm. particularly when the outcomes are equivalent. So the palliative care industry well, I shouldn't call it an industry, the palliative care services, are a means whereby much of that end-of-life care can be transferred from a, a high economic cost, high environmental cost environment to a community-based environment mm. with improved outcomes yeah. for patients. So, again, once you start to think through this framework of moving healthcare from a high carbon cost to a low carbon cost, mm. there are some examples, and good palliative care is one of them, where the consumer wins, mm. the system wins, and the planet wins. So we've got to start to turn our minds towards some of those possibilities because yeah. just that one could be huge if we invested in it sensibly. So there's like lots of ideas that we can latch onto and implement. How do we actually get them implemented? Well, I, I, there, <laughs> there are people who know that plenty more than me, but mm. I can speak from the practitioner's point mm. of view, and that is healthcare practitioners are hungry for mm. this kind of information because we're hearing it from the whole of the community. And, and you know, if someone were to say to us, for example, here's puffer A for asthma, and here's puffer B, and puffer B has one-tenth, you, you know, we would, with the permission of our patients, we would switch our patients. So it is providing the information mm. to everyone, not just doctors, nurses, and allied health professionals, but to consumers, and especially to systems planners. Yeah. I guess with that in mind, um, Amanda, the data you've collected so far, it's still early days, but it's carving out this really clear narrative and we get an idea of where it should be going and how to implement it. What do you hope the next steps for your current project is and how do you think it can be used to shift mindsets? Mm. That's a great question. Mm. Uh, obviously, we hope that we can quantify what that is for one, these two procedures that we're looking at. What we're also hoping that we'll do is develop a little bit of a model, if you like, that we can then go and find other procedures. Mm. So not just to, uh, I, I'm going to call, I'm going to get this term wrong, identical procedures from a clinical outcome mm. point of view, something along those lines, medically verified. If we can find other procedures like that, and we mm. have a model effectively for how, what information do you need, how can you analyse that? I think that will be the next thing that we will do. But ultimately, what we're hoping we will be able to do is give that quantification of where that systemic cost mm. is sitting in the healthcare system. Because you can use a, a, you know, puffer A versus puffer B, that will have a tiny impact on the greenhouse gas emissions reduction. If we can show that the total carbon emissions that are basically the system cost of running the healthcare system, if you mm. like, and the ho our whole economic system, which is tied around that, if we can begin to shift some of those choices, they're not gonna, it's not gonna happen overnight, but it, yeah. it will happen. We will start to reduce the demand for certain types of goods and services that generate electricity or that you, you, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are generated to support them. So in the healthcare setting, obviously that's really important. Mm. Um, it's important for us in our everyday lives as well. But the thing that I think is really exciting about the healthcare sector, I'm gonna pick up on a little bit of, about what Rashmi said is, it's probably one of the only industries that has an enormously positive social license to operate. Mm. 
If you look at what the mining companies do to try and make you feel really good about the fact that they're doing everything that they can to decarbonise, they're a long way further ahead, effectively because they have to be. Because as a society we go, oh, I don't know. So they need to, to buy their social licence to operate. Mm. The, the healthcare sector is one of those sectors that everyone agrees should be there. Yeah. And everyone wants it to be there and everyone wants those decisions to be as easy as possible for them when they come down to that moment where they're taking their small child to an mm. emergency. And if the system has done the thinking on what are those choices so that it's very straightforward. Okay, we've got two choices for you, identical and a clinical outcome. Mm. Here's the difference for you from a carbon outcome. I think then we get... Everyone will be willing to go along on that journey because we like the healthcare system. Yeah. And I think it's so incredible that the two of you are here doing that research and collecting that data so we can actually make those types of decisions. Rashmi, how do you think we can actually implement that change for more sustainable healthcare? In terms of the innovation that comes out of health systems? or well, I think just in general. like there, there are plenty of researchers collecting incredible data yeah. like what we're seeing here. How do we create that social change? How do we get it implemented into policy? That's a really good question. And I think policy at the moment with our change in government has been incredible. Like mm. to see this shift that we haven't seen in over a decade in Australia, mm. where the government currently is po taking positive steps towards, you know, it's, it's the biggest change in climate legislation that we've had in over a decade. Mm. And I think specifically in regards to healthcare and climate change, we now uh, are in the development, the government is in the development of a climate and health framework, a strategic framework that will allow alignment between all the states and territories, districts, and down to the hospital level, mm. um, for everyone to be aligned in what they can do. And that's incredible. We have never had that before. Um, that being said, you know, uh, as Amanda said, and so did David, uh, this kind of positive push an agency that we want to give people, the patients, to make the right decisions. That's been a narrative that is becoming super, super strong at the moment. Mm. And again, that's going to push things forward. As we had a few weeks ago, you know, there were three up to 3,000 medical professionals campaigning against fracking in, in the Northern Territory. Mm. You know, they were there at the front line saying, this is going to disrupt the health system. This is not going to be good for our patients. And that is a narrative that everybody's going to buy into because at the end of the day, what we care about is our families and our health and our community's health. Mm. Um, the other important thing that's happening at the moment is uh, before Senate right now, there is a duty of bill, duty of care bill that's um, being presented. Uh, that is a climate change amendment that's being put forward. And so basically what that states, it imposes a statutory duty on decision makers. Um, to one, consider the likely impact of decisions that could harm the climate on the health and well-being of current and future children as a paramount consideration. And two, not to make a decision that could harm the climate if the decision poses a material risk of harm to the health and well-being of current and future children in Australia. Mm. So that, there is a real push for that right now. And I think the more we are aware of that, the more policy change can occur, the more communities can push for that narrative to end up in government to say, hey, this is about Australians, this is about our health. We already have an incredible healthcare system. Let's keep that going. Mm. Yeah. David, are you seeing that on the ground? Are people very interested in this so yeah. far? I, I was just thinking about that as Rashmus, and the answer is sadly not yet. Mm. It hasn't permeated to mainstream consciousness in clinical decision making. Yeah. And that's why we have to tread relatively carefully to preserve quality and safety. Mm. But knowledge is power. Yeah. And I don't say that glibly. It is once you... It, it will be demanded of the system. Um, Rashmi already talked about legislative things and now there are competitions between hospital A and hospital B about which is the greener, mm. you know, preparing lunches and things like that. So it yeah. is permeating into consciousness. But because of the nature of the audience that are listening... There are, I mean, I've learned so much about this in the last couple of years because this is truly a space where multidisciplinary research, I know everyone says multidisciplinary research is great, mm. but this is a space where it won't happen without people crossing out of their silos. So people from my hospital working with the Sydney Environment Institute, working with the Faculty of Science, working with economists, working with policy people, mm. that's how it's going to happen. And just an ex as an example of something that's really important, 
we do have to establish a standard methodology. So, for example, if I want to know... I did an operation on someone this morning to close a hole in their heart. And if I want to know what the carbon cost of that is, I can have someone come in and say, well, you opened this pack and three people drove in from their homes and this is how long the electricity was on and that cost 120 kiloton or kilojoules or something. But the better way to do it is to say, you do 200 of these a year, David, and the whole endeavour for the entire year costs this, and you've got to divide that by 200. And you get very, very different numbers as to whether you look at the carbon cost of an individual procedure or you look at the carbon cost of an entire entity mm. and divide it by the number of procedures. You can get a tenfold difference mm. in the absolute number of the environmental impact. So just a plea, and this is such early days in mm. this field, it's really... And we've got to have a standard methodology that everyone accepts. And if that's reporting two numbers, the sort of case-by-case case versus the entirety, then so be it. Mm. But I think the answer to your question is we're still a long way from home mm. about this kind of information starting to have an impact. Yeah, actually, on that note, Amanda, um, where are those types of differences coming from in the data and why is the method you're currently working with the one that we're advocating for being... Um, taken up by more clinicians? Hmm. I think I would say that there are two methodologies that mm. David's alluding to, and both of them are good, and both mm. of them serve a purpose. Mm. They answer different questions. Mm. So the, the idea of someone working out how long the operating theatre was running for and mm. what um, products you used and calculating for each unit of, I don't know, whatever the things you're using when you do that, <laughs> how much carbon was generated to create that one particular thing, that's generally using a methodology called life cycle assessment. Uh, the limitation with that assessment is that you can only go so far back in the supply chain. So well, let's say it was forceps. I don't know. Yes? Okay, good. I'm learning lots here. Oh, wait, it goes both ways. Um, let's say it was forceps. We can say this is how much uh, carbon was embedded in the manufacture of those forceps. Uh, forceps. But do we know how much carbon was embedded in the manufacture of the machinery that made the forceps and how much carbon was embedded in the sheet metal that went into making that machine all the way back to the iron ore when it was dug out of the Pilbara in mm. Australia. So the life cycle assessment by default has to have a boundary. When we move from tracing the physical units and start looking at the monetary units, that enables us to look at the whole economy. And as I mentioned before, as a society, we like to know where our money goes. So there is a lot of information out there that enables us to track those interconnected interconnections between the economy. There are limitations with that as well because we actually can't tell the difference between this brand of forceps and that brand of forceps because mm. we're relying on the resolution of the economic data. So in answer to your question, I think you actually need to say which methodology helps you answer which question mm. and what information do we have. Now, in an ideal world, if we decided as a society that we want to be able to account for our carbon or our biodiversity loss or social impacts as well as we account for our money, there's mm. actually no reason why we can't track it at that level of detail. We just choose not to. The statisticians uh, pick up data on... Uh, the ABS sends out surveys to companies on their money. How much money did they make? How much money did they set spend? Companies have to report their greenhouse gas emissions, but only if they are huge contributors to greenhouse gases. So if we as a society decided that this was important enough to track, we could choose to measure as well. And so I think ultimately that would, that would be amazing and then we wouldn't have to sort of worry about the limitations on the edge of both of these methodologies and both of them would help us answer the questions that we need to be able to answer to know which choices to make. And wouldn't that be brilliant, having all of that data to help inform those decisions? Mm -hmm. um, I think the... We, we are saying that there is not enough interest from clinicians. How do you want to get them more interested beyond just getting that data to tell that story? I think it's getting the data. Yeah. And also, I think things might be imposed on us. For example, I'm told appropriately, regularly, that I can only do a certain number of procedures a year and that will then exceed the budget. So. Professionals in all walks of life are used to having limitations on what they've done, but in healthcare, for the reasons Amanda articulated, because it's a virtuous profession, you tend not to place limits on it. But it is very hard to sit in front of an individual and have the economic wherewithal to provide them with 
the numero uno treatment, mm. but to pull back from that for reasons of carbon emission. So it is a, a complex thing, but the first thing is to generate the data. Yeah. And there truly are a lot of examples where you can arrive at the point where you want to be by several different pathways. Mm. I guess then, Rashmi, once we have that data, how do you think we can best influence change? I think I have a, a little bit of a different perspective on mm. this because I think we have enough data to make decisions on my side of the coin. Mm. <laughs> um, we know enough of the health impacts of emissions mm. from certain sectors. Mm. We know enough. In fact, we know too much at this point. Um, I think I've got here, you know, there's the, the, we, can, we have the methodology to say from the air pollution from this coal station, this many people died, this many premature deaths happened, this many people, I think it was 14,500 cases of childhood asthma from each of those coal stations at an average. So we know this information mm. enough to make decisions. I think what is lacking is good governance. And it's, it's not coherent enough. It's knowing this and not doing it. Mm. It's kind of, you know, we think now back just to the biggest example we can have in terms of a crisis in health from COVID-19. Did we know about pandemics before? We sure did. <laughs> it's, that wasn't new information as much as we'd like to pretend it was. We knew what hygienic behaviours we needed to implement. We knew that we needed to talk to behavioural scientists to make sure that our infrastructure and our social structure was ready. That wasn't new. In terms of what was missing, to me on my side, is not so much data and information, it's, it's governance. Mm. It's decision makers taking up that information, listening to clinicians, listening to academics, understanding people are working on this issue and when they say, hey, here is my expertise, please take it forward, do something because you're in a position of power, there's no accountability and mm. that is what's lacking. And I think you said before we've seen a recent change in governance and greater implementation of policies that should be making our healthcare system more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, what would you hope comes next? What, what would you like to see implemented next? Or how can we further push that agenda? Um, by holding our decision makers and our politicians accountable. Mm. Because, you know, for the first time with the new coal mines that have opened, there was a climate assessment that needed to be completed for those to be approved. Mm. The numbers that came from that, you know, politicians can say, oh, that's valid. Any scientist reading that, it's abhorrent. <laughs> the impact is so bad. And yet there is no coherence between the two. You know, decisions are getting made without the input of people with the knowledge. Yeah. There is a clear separation. So I think using health, which every single person is invested in, like our panel has mentioned many times, we're all invested in this sector. This sector we need. No one can, can, can function without it. Um, but using that health argument is something that I'd like to see be pushed further forward for whether projects go forward and that duty of care, you know, mm. the, our politicians and our decision makers have that duty of care. We've seen, oh yeah, you can go. I was just going to say, I, I think we're in violent agreement. <laughs> yeah. there, yes. there, there, there are two separate ideas here though. One is how do we make healthcare better to reduce carbon yeah. emissions? And the other is how do we make the world better so that it impacts on healthcare. Yeah, the ship in the iceberg. Yeah, the ship in the iceberg. <laughs> um, do you think we've seen in the UK and the US that they've had more policy implemented to support sustainable healthcare? Um, and is there anything we can learn from that? Because I feel like we, we've started to make headway recently, but we're still trailing behind in some ways. I think the conversation is picking up more and more speed mm. um, at the moment, which is great, because more and more... Um, Governments are taking this forward. Mm. Uh, recently at the G20, there was plenty of mention about climate and health. Mm. Um, and you'll see this in, uh, at the UN COP conference in Dubai later this year. Mm. Um, health is one of the main agenda topics that will be discussed. Uh, the thing to look out for and where it could be a problem is we had greenwashing. Mm. We might potentially run the risk of having health washing. And that is something that is being spoken about in certain circles yeah. and to avoid that, to say, oh, but, you know, we can 
open this facility that's carbon neutral. Put, look over there while we open this coal mine. <laughs> um, so I think th if we need to just be vigilant and be alert. That doesn't happen. But I think there's plenty of examples of um, governments taking up that initiative. I think it's come from both sides, where people are pushing this forward. You know, more disasters are happening. Health responses are not as strong um, in those moments. So we live in a we live in on a planet that we need to work together on. Yeah. You know, I'm going to open up to the audience for questions. That's both in person and online to everyone who's tuning in over there. Um, if you haven't already, you can submit and upvote questions via slido.com using the code Sydney Ideas. It's one word, capital S, capital I. Um, there are some great questions already coming through that I'm really excited to explore with you. But for those of you in the room, we also have some roving mics. Where are they? Our roving, there they are. Hello, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so if you are in person and want to ask a question, Stick your hand up, look excited. But I do ask that you wait till you have the microphone in front of you before you ask the question so everyone at home can still hear you as well and just try and refrain from making statements and make sure we're definitely still asking questions. Um, but I saw a couple of hands up if you guys want to start moving towards them. In the meantime, I might just ask a quick question from Slido. Oh, the internet is refreshing. Give me one second. You can go first if you like. <laughs> Hi, I was wondering if I could ask a quick question. I'm interested as to why you would push the decision at the point of care to a patient. Mm. Why wouldn't we use our systems and our bureaucracy uh, within the healthcare system to make conscious decisions around impact on the environment and push through the, the right choices at that point. It, it does sound a little big brotherish to me. <laughs> um, that, that is how clinical medicine works. You, uh, a but carer it, and a patient make a decision at the point of care. That's how it happens. Someone comes in with breast cancer and you say there's surgery or there's radiotherapy or there's chemotherapy and they're all three and that might take several conversations. It would be a bit scary if someone said to me, you can't do surgery on a woman with breast cancer because the operating theatre generates too much electricity. Um, so I think we've got to be terribly careful when we impose uh, an external force on the decision making at the point of care, if I've understood your question correctly. I'm not saying a choice between treatment or not treatment. I'm saying giving a choice of both of these treatments will have the same outcome, but this one is more sustainable. Oh, yeah. That's illogical, right? That's what we have our systems, our healthcare systems there to do. If, our, if the conscious choice is greener healthcare, why would we give an option to a patient to make that, make that choice if the outcomes are the same for the patient? Mm. It is actually very rare in clinical medicine to have truly identical patient outcomes between treatment options. There, there are some examples, like stent versus bypass surgery, but there are even individual factors there. Someone might say, well, you say I should have a stent, but my neighbour had one and died during the procedure, so I'd, if it's all the same to you, I'd rather have the bypass operation. So uh, I think you're absolutely right if there are truly identical outcomes and we generate the data, which is what we're trying to do, I, I couldn't agree more, that would be a great thing. But we do have to be careful that they are truly equivalent outcomes and we're not sort of sliding away from that. Beautiful, I have a question online. Um, so how does Australia compare with other similar countries when it comes to sustainable healthcare? Are we doing well? No. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, no. I think um, in terms of how Australia is doing in terms of sustainable healthcare, we're on the move. I think, are we there? Have we reached home base? Definitely not. But I think now with so many teams being set up, both on a regional primary care hospital, but also federal level for what needs to be done, um, we're getting there. I, so mm -hmm. I feel positive. But would I say globally we're the best? No, I don't think anywhere's the best at the moment. I feel like 
in terms of sustainable healthcare, this is still up and coming. We're all setting up teams. Um, you look at health systems internationally, we don't have a full way of quantifying what is truly sustainable with healthcare mm -hmm. on that level just yet. Um, we have certain bits of evidence for things that we can approve, improve, and we're trying to do that. Uh, and it's also about, you know, resources mm. and how much we're willing to spend and equity. Because I think for a healthcare system to be truly sustainable, mm. it needs to be equitable. And like the Titanic, um, it does tend to favor the roses of the world and not the jacks. Yeah. The Titanic fans out there. Yeah. There was a I mean, we're all Titanic there, fans. <laughs> there was no space on the plank. I don't think so. There was. But, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> she had a great time and she yeah. lived. So I think we're still dealing with equity problems in terms of healthcare until we face that head on. And I guess a quick follow-on question from that. If Australia is not doing fantastic in the global scene, mm. is there something we can learn from another country that you hope we would implement and learn from? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think in terms of, specifically when we look at preparedness mm. and disaster risk reduction, what we're looking at now is the rise of disasters mm. more frequently. And our preparedness is patchy at best. So I think in terms of access to healthcare, access to relief, um, we can't just forget the lessons that we should have learnt from the bushfires and the floods. And we tend to do that. We tend to have short-term memory sometimes. Um, but the great things that we do learn are, you know, with early warning systems and how we send out alerts. We just need to build on previous learnings. Mm. And in terms of preparedness, understand that unlike other countries have faced problems that we too might face one day. And I think that's one thing that came out of COVID-19 that I wish Australia would have taken forward. Yeah, that, you know, preparedness. I, I, I am going to sound a bit like Rashmi here yeah. because I think one of the things that holds us back as a country is that our whole infrastructure is very carbon intensive. Yes. And so what I have seen, and nowhere near as much as you, but some of the research that I've had a look at in the Netherlands in particular, where mm. they have a greening health, yeah. they've come up with their whole country has decided that they will go green mm. and then they have a deliberate strategy for the healthcare strategy. But that's underpinned by the fact that their whole society gets the fact yeah. that we need to decarbonise and also they don't make export dollars from shipping coal. Ooh. So there's a whole lot Ooh. of systemic <laughs> Problems that we have, uh, problems or challenges that yes. we have in Australia that the healthcare system kind of piggybacks on. So mm -hmm. until our electricity infrastructure is not uh, driven by coal fired power, until we have come up with a just transition of not relying on our GDP, relying on coal exports for our GDP, mm -hmm. it's almost like there's not a lot that the healthcare system can do. So all of us with our political agency can start to influence that as well. How yeah. do we get society? How do we get our government yeah. taking these things seriously? Because as you take carbon out of the whole system, you will take carbon out of the healthcare system. Exactly yeah. right. That was wonderful. I want to like a round of applause for that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there was a hand up near the front. Was I correct? Hi. Um, my question goes to the um, thing around scale and also urgency. Like we're in a climate crisis, so the faster we can move, the more we might survive. 60% um, of Sydney's emissions are from buildings, about 20% is from transport, about 10% is from waste. The 60% of, of emissions that are coming from buildings, like if the minister just signed to buy renewable energy, then that would switch all of the public health buildings across to renewable energy and you'd, you'd cut your emissions right there. Um, transport, obviously, there's electric vehicles. Waste is more tricky. I guess I've got a question around, have you seen good examples in your research around what, what can we do with the waste impact bit? Because that's more fragmented and it's not as easy as a ministerial sign off on a procurement contract for energy. We're not doing very well on waste in healthcare. Mm. It, it doesn't, I, I've never been told which pack has the fewer. I mean, I would be embarrassed to tell you when someone opens a surgical pack, which maybe has 20 items in it, and I might use two of them, and the whole pack gets discarded. So I think waste is one example where there's a lot of upside that could be done quickly 
and speaking to the point Amanda just made, it actually needs a body that is going to consider that specific issue. But that's an area where in healthcare I think we could have quite big wins quite quickly. Um, I'm going to jump to a question on here. Would you mind just heading up towards someone at the back there for the next one? Um, so the answer to reducing hospitals' carbon footprint is to keep people out of hospitals. Are we missing the biggest impact by, by not focusing on primary care? Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm a big advocate for primary care and community care. Um, I think the reliance on uh, preven prevention isn't there and it should be. Mm. And I think in terms of our health literacy, and again, this is what, going back to what Amanda said, it needs to be a whole systems reaction to this. It can't just be like, oh, this one space changes its behavior. That's not gonna fix it. Um, our health literacy is pretty low in Australia, and I think it needs to go back to education reform, but also in terms of primary care, understanding where to access healthcare on a primary setting. It's changed so much, you know, with pharmacies, the landscape is now very, very different. Before the setup was you have your general practice, you have your local pharmacy, and they all talk to each other, and they have your health information very centralized mm. in your community. And it's no longer the case, it's, it's quite patchy. Um, so I think there have been efforts previously to bring that all in together, but uh, I would love to see more focus on primary care, definitely. Mm. I know that a while back, uh, I was involved in healthcare homes. There was an initiative that was being pushed forward um, that was in trial, but not sure what that's up to at the moment. Um, it'll be interesting to see how primary care becomes more, it, re it resembles kind of what happens in hospital settings where there's more of a triaging happening on a community level. Mm. Yeah, I have an interesting anecdote to that, that question. Uh, so this is just some preliminary research mm. that I'm working on for another bit of research is having a look at quantifying the carbon savings from telehealth, mm. So, uh, which particularly around COVID-19. And interestingly, in the literature we've review we've done, nearly every single paper around the carbon savings of telehealth are talking about specialist care. Mm. We've found two papers so far, and we haven't finished, we found two papers who've answered that question from a primary care mm. point of view. So there's something there in terms of the research is still very much focused on that care that gets delivered in a hospital setting rather than saying even just the, the carbon savings of people not going to the GP but mm. doing a video consultation or anything. So I think that space is also very, very early on mm. and there's probably a lot of savings there because if yeah. you see the GP and you get the feedback that you need, you're not going to end up in emergency at 11 o'clock at night. Mm. Yeah. But there is a more nuanced problem here and that is that our primary care sector is very weak at the moment. It's been progressively degraded, mainly because Medicare was frozen for 10 years and healthcare costs went up for 8% per year. And that meant that many general practices have had to shut down mm. and primary care is a much less attractive option for graduates. So when I graduated, about 55% of graduates wanted to go into general practice. It's now 15%. Mm. So our emergency departments are absolutely bursting at the seams because our primary care system can't cope. So whereas I agree completely mm. that if we shifted towards primary care, we'd save a lot of environmental impact, the predicate of that is you have to have a strong primary care system, mm -hmm. which we currently don't have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you think we could have that? Oh, that would require a lot of investment. Yeah. But again, it's, it's exactly what Amanda and Rashmi were saying earlier. You've got to have a body that's thinking about this. Mm. You've got to have a body that says, well, if we want to keep people out of hospital and stop the building costs, then you've got to have an alternate place for them to go mm. that they trust. And with the corporatisation of general practice and the relative unaffordability of single practitioners running general practices, it needs a concerted governmental action mm. to reverse that alarming trend. Yeah. Um, the question up the back. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Bonnie. I'm from RPA. <laughs> Hello, David. <laughs> So many things are happening in RPA and I was just thinking all about recycles, how frustrating it is, is just throwing out things continuously and, you know, having contracts with so many recycle companies that it's just waiting to get out of contracts and it's just that frustrating thing of throwing things out is really stressful. 
And I find that a lot of the, um, because I work in neonatal intensive care, I find that a lot of the families with these newborn babies are thinking about the environmental impact of what we are doing. So I think they're a really good resource that we can use in um, going forward with um, carbon emissions and everything. So I think that that's something is really good to use because they are a f our future. And then I was, you were just talking about something else a minute ago. What was that? Oh, yeah, virtual, virtual care. We've tried all of that. But it is what you're saying, the community uh, healthcare is really, um, has been whittled. whittled. <laughs> and it's, it is very difficult to try and expand when we're so exhausted in the hospital system. And that we need, we do need support from everybody. Because you're, you're running around trying to get on there, these committees, trying to think of everything, but you're still trying to do your job. It's like you've got thousands of hats on and you can't do everything. And we really need a hand. So, yeah. Um, I'm so. not listening to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. That's yeah. it. I think need I a hand. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> that actually leads into a question that I have here. Um, what are the next steps that the industry should take? Please comment on industry actions related to New South Wales government net zero plan. My understanding yeah. of that plan is that it has four particular sections. Well, first one is measurement, so that's kind of my shop. So we, yeah. we have to understand what our emissions are. Mm. The next one is the mitigation, so how do we reduce those emissions? Where are the places that we can reduce those emissions? In healthcare, there are going to be places where we can't reduce those emissions. We need, at the moment, we have, I assume, fuel-based ambulances. They're not EVs, so we don't want to take ambulances off the road, so mm. we will have to burn petrol or diesel, whatever fires them. And, and some of the anaesthetic gases we use are greenhouse gas emissions as well. So there are things that we do have to use, but the mitigation step is saying avoid any emission that you can and mm. then only use the ones that you... The, you, the ones that you have to emit, then you stick with those. The third one is a, around abatement, so looking at what are the implications. So as we do increase our carbon emissions, what impact is that going to have on the healthcare system, which is exactly what you were talking about. So how do we be prepared for the next bushfires or the next mm. floods, whatever comes? And then the final one, and this is where you guys will be much better, I think is health in all. So looking at all the policies that come up, are we considering mm -hmm. health in every policy that, mm -hmm. that we come up with from a government point of view? Mm -hmm. Which I think is where the magic will happen is if all these policies that the government comes up with are, are thinking of each other. So can we shift to renewable energy on all the hospitals? Hospitals are huge campuses. Why mm -hmm. don't we have solar panels on all the roofs? Mm -hmm. So all those kinds of things, if the government is thinking about each of them as they go through and a consolidated effort, then mm -hmm. I think that will help. Yeah, probably that's a a policy no, no, question. That, no, that's <laughs> perfectly answered. I think I would have echoed everything that Amanda mm. said. I think the missing part in terms of this plan and I, is accountability and consequence. Yeah. So you, we can say all of this, but what is the consequence of not doing it and who's going to be held accountable if it doesn't get done? And I think, you know, we can say, sometimes I think we look at these plans as a, oh, this is a nice to do. And it really, it isn't. This is a matter of life and death. So I think in terms of there should, be, there should be consequences if this doesn't get done. There should be people that are held accountable if this doesn't get passed through. And we don't really tend to have bodies that look at that unless it goes into like a royal commission or something, yeah. which, is, which is devastating. So I or think that's, we vote. Or we vote, yeah. <laughs> which we should we all be doing, which we're forced to do. But I think it's... There should we should already have started that process before we get to that point. Mm. So that's the missing part for me. Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to add, David? Um, are there any last questions in the room? Yes. Yes, that's you. You won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing is, and I also work at RPA um, in maternity services. The other thing is that um, that I'm unaware of. I've come from the private sector as well is we need to engage with private industries as well in our journey and looking at procurements and things like that. And I agree, accountability. So if we are buying something, what's the end result? How does it, it should be recycling. So that if you're producing a product, how does it go back into the system so it can be reused? And what is, if you don't do that, what is the health effect on our society? Because health should be health without harm. So you need to have that, that um, philosophies uh, to drive the whole thing. 
and private and public sector needs to share that responsibility. So I might just end on the last question that's here. Um, the big monkey in the room is activity-based funding. And where is the role for moving to outcome-based funding so people don't do more but do better? That's been tried so often. Mm. And you have to wait five years to work out what your outcomes are. Mm. So it's a terrific idea to say we will pay you according to how someone with a condition does, how long they live. But in terms of timely impact, it can't work. Mm. Would anybody else like to add anything else there? Um, I think it goes back to the accountability. Mm. I think the reason... Accountability. <laughs> I think the reason why we don't have more outcome-based funding is because it holds people accountable mm. all the way through until the end. And so the, we find loopholes not to get it done. And also I think in terms of how our funding mechanisms work and who can go up and bid against it. And now at the moment, a, the big kind of conversation we're having around management consulting firms and their close, close ties with our government and whether that's working or not, mm. who bids for these activities within our health system. They're not subject matter experts necessarily. Mm. And where is the accountability? And so I think, obviously, it should be outcome-based and not just activity-based. Mm. But when you've got people, you need to see where the money's going, right? And why certain companies are bidding for them so they yeah. keep the problem ongoing. Well, I think normally whenever we have conversations about climate change, I leave with this like pit of dread. <laughs> but I hope today you feel what I'm feeling and I'm feeling a little bit of hope, a little bit of excitement. We have people on the ground who care. We have data coming out so we can actually answer questions. We have people working to implement that change. So I'm feeling quite hopeful, just a little bit. And I do, do look forward to seeing some change in the future within our policy systems as well. Can I have a huge round of applause, please, for Amanda, David, and Rashmi. Can we have a round of applause as well for Andrea Huang from Sydney Ideas? Where are you in your fabulous shirt? Can you do a little spin for us? Look at Andrea. Do, do a spin in the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. That's okay. Um, thank you to Kirsten Jackson and the Sydney Environment Institute team who are co-presenters of this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to all of you who came online and in person and asked your really wonderful questions. If you enjoyed this, which I hope you did, you can join us for the next Sydney Ideas event where you'll get to take... Oh, you had to talk to a science denier and learn why, against all facts and evidence, people believe things from conspiracy theories to fake news. You'll hear from a philosopher, cognitive scientist, and digital platforms researcher. So it's back here, same place, same time, on the 12th of September for Breaking Down Disinformation. If you want to find out about more future Sydney Ideas events, head to sydney.edu.au forward slash sydney-ideas. This has been Sydney Ideas. I'm Dr. Naomi Cabellic. Thank you so much. <laughs>